Sports fans, welcome to the Shop Report. I'm Barbershop Jay. I'll be your host for the day. Here's what's happening. Now, before we dive into today's topics, sports-related or maybe otherwise, we'll see if we have time. I want to bring to you or introduce to you all one of my main, main cats. Not from here, but used to live here in Cleveland. Community activist and Rucker... That's right, the infamous Rucker Park playground baller, New York City's finest, or one of, because I like the NYC in general, my main man, Brother Richard. What's going on, bro? My brother and my friend, I'm honored to be with you and to be with your audience on this program. You know, let's get it. You know, I've been honored to speak to you for some time. You're one of my favorite sports analysts, sports interpreters. And yes, I did say interpreters because sometimes as just a fan, when we look at what's happening on the screen, we need it interpreted by those who understand what we're looking at. So I'm always honored and privileged to be in your presence and your company in any form, man. So let's get it. Thank you Uh for having me. Oh, all day, every day. And I'm glad you used the term or word interpreted because a lot of times folks watch TV and it's a reason why it's called television. You get what I'm saying? And they they get done watching it and they go straight to the water cooler, especially when it comes to sports. You know, uh, everybody wants to debate this and debate that, but they're using as their basis for debate something somebody else said and not their own. You get what I'm saying? Something that somebody said off the TV. And I don't knock... The first takes and the, and the Mike and Mike's, well, the Mike go looking Wingo now, but you get what I'm saying? I don't, and the PTIs, yeah. I don't knock their perspectives. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But I just, for the life of me, can't fathom how you could watch or say you're a sports fan or a sports debater and watch the program and then verbatim go back and spit it as if though it, it was your own thought. That just is, is, is befuddling to me. Well, you know, uh, Jay, you know, one of the things I always say, and we've had this conversation, you and I, many times, because you you went to school, this is right in your ballpark, and you know better than most that that's, in fact, and indeed, rightly called commercial television. That's commercial radio. Oh, and programming. Those commercials, that's programming. And those <laughs> commercials you. pay for that. And so they are not allowed, no matter how good they are, Stephen A. Smith, Shannon Sharps, the, how great we might love them and respect them for their insight. The reality is they're only allowed to interpret that and to give us an insight into that but so much because their corporate sponsors won't allow them to speak but so much. And we saw that this past season with the football and the activism of some of y'all young brothers on the field of sport and play and in the arena of entertainment, whether it be singers. And we saw the backlash that came with that. And we saw that some uh-huh. of those gentlemen and some of those women and some of those analysts, they had to kowtow to that because at the end of the day, what are we facing? A backlash from even the president of the United States because the commercial appeal overrides any other interest as it relates to our society. So, you know, we, we continue to rock and roll with it. It is what it is. We just understand that it is what it is and we roll with it anyway oh okay and when you talk about the young brothers in, in regards to football you're speaking of colin kaepernick i'm sure absolutely in particular mm-hmm. most definitely and in particular that part like we say in los angeles yeah okay well i'm definitely in agreement with that so let's get to some of this action that we got set up here for the day now you and i met at the barbershop indeed and, and our thesis or our theme surrounding what we do is sports commentary from a barbershop perspective Indeed. Because because the barbershop is the cornerstone of every community. And I know there are people out there have heard me say this before, but I got to always say or try to throw that in there to remind folk that what we say and where it comes from, it, it can't be quantified. You get what I'm saying? Indeed. Um, it's, a, it's natural. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, we've had plenty of discussions, you and I, in the shop. You know, we cover a wide range of topics from politics to music. But the, what sports talk is the primary function of yes. what it is that we do in our debates, okay? So let me ask you, in all of this talk, and we're going to definitely get to the Cavs and all of the Cavs woes 
And it, and it seems like that's an ongoing theme, too, and what, what the, their drama. But I want to talk to you about the Golden State Warriors. Okay. Now, the folk have heard me say ad nauseum what I think about the Warriors. But I've made mention on more than one occasion that the Warriors, although they are a juggernaut, or if you want to say they're a juggernaut, that being true to a large degree, that they do have a weakness. And that weakness, the Cavs in 2015 started to exploit it, but stopped for whatever reason. When they had a 2-1 lead using Mozgov on the inside and LeBron basically on the outside. The Warriors' weakness is their front line. And nothing says that more, if you want to throw in an addendum, if you would, when Draymond Green, I don't know if it was game three, which, of course, one of those games was a pivotal game in that in the 2017 yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. finals. And in that game, you know, there was a lot of talk uh, by way of the entertainment media. LeBron James found himself in a situation with kind of like uh, Draymond Green was under or near, near the rim, and LeBron had him in the paint, and he passed to his left out to Kyle Korver. And then there was a 700-year uh, dis- long discussion on – whether or not if he made the right play or so on and so forth, whatever the case may be. And I'm saying this. In order to beat the Golden State Warriors, yes, their weakness, again, is in their front line. And in that situation, which we all know the outcomes of games, regardless of the sport, hinge largely on what you do in that situation. He should have taken it to Draymond Green because here is a fact. Andrew Bogut, JaVale McGee, Zaza Pachulia, Draymond Green, primarily make up the Warriors, and I'm being facetious here, vaunted front line. It does not get exposed, similar to, and I'll use the Steelers, the NFL's Steelers as an example to make this analogy. For years you heard how the Steelers' front seven was just dominant, and they were, but that their secondary was weak, and it was. But it did not show itself because the front seven was so dominant. You get what I'm saying? The Absolutely. same thing serves the purpose for the Warriors in their perimeter of Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, and Steph Curry. Now, we'll talk about their bench, too. The bench definitely plays a huge impact. you got to have one of those as well. But okay. for the sake of this argument. So what they do on the perimeter, especially offensively, covers up the, their, the deficiencies of their front line. And I say this, how, to def- how do you defend the dubs? Well, the first thing is playing offense. And what I mean by playing offense is you have to get them and slow the game down and play in a half-court set. And in your half-court set, you have to, once again, go inside. Your focus first has to be on the inside. Because if you go inside first, you get their front line in foul trouble. And at the same time, you are getting opportunities for free points at the free throw line as opposed to, or excuse me, not as opposed to also in addition to the Cavs fell in love and are still for whatever reason, as most teams are nowadays, the three ball or the three point shot. And they had broken a record throughout one of these finals runs for most three pointers in a game or a season, whatever. 25 is the number that comes to mind, but they fell in love with that and they, relied on being able to outshoot them and outrun them. Well, your shot selection has to work in conjunction with your inside because if your shot selection is all threes, we all know long shots lead to long runouts. So you're, in essence, helping the Golden State Warriors to beat you. So I'm going to ask, what say you? And then afterwards, I'm going to read some snippets of an article I found by a guy Michael Bradley, who writes for Lindy's uh, Pro Basketball, wrote this article, and I didn't even know it until a couple of minutes ago. But it's, the, the title of the article is Stopping the Unstoppable, and he's talking about the Warriors. He's saying the Warriors bring a new level of scary. And this is when Kevin Durant first was added or went to the Warriors. He hadn't played a game for them yet. Um, and it's basically how to defend the Warriors. So what say you? Um, you know, Jay, I'm going to say it like this to you in, in, in my response to this. I'm beginning like saying, saying it like this. One of the reasons I referred to you initially um, as an interpreter of sports is that, as you so wonderfully just articulated for us, what the Warriors 
do and what could potentially be done about them, my rejoinder to you, my response to you is always like this. I think that the problem that you have with the Golden State Warriors is that any team can be beaten. Any team can be defended. Certainly, we understand that. Um, nevertheless, with the Golden State Warriors, one of the things that you have with them is that I think teams are going to run into that they have not run into as of yet this season. And the Cavs, when they ran into the Golden State Warriors, I'll say this. Everything you said systematically, programmatically was correct. That didn't factor in one thing. And this is the kind of thing I think analytics does not factor in in sports. Or explain. Or explain. You're not able to interpret or, or explain to me, okay, but what makes a player like Kevin Durant, who's never played big his entire career, play big when he wants to? What makes a player mm. like AI, Andre Iguodala, <laughs> who looks every year like it could be his last, but when he gets to the playoff, he does amazing things. That's an amazing team. And I think that you alluded to an article that you're going to tell us about, about this Warriors, they bring a new level of scary. And I think that what makes them scary is that if all of those players come to play, including their 12th man, who remember now, they have a somebody the Lakers used to have, who is now literally riding their bench, and he's, what, 10, 11 now on their bench? Uh, 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 you have players who, uh, then they have the seventh player coming off their bench is a, is a former Laker as well. And so you've got players that are there that are hungry. They keep the rotation going. And we were talking about this earlier where we talked about the Cavs. The, the Golden State Warriors have a hungry squad. They want to win. And when they come prepared... I believe their challenge in the West now is Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City is going to bring them problems because of Westbrook and solely because of Westbrook and what he brings and that beautiful three that they bring to the court now with Carmelo having his thing to prove. And certainly uh, um, Paul George has always and certainly has always been one of my favorite players. In the NBA. Yeah. So I totally would agree with you. I would just say that the Warriors do. I agree with whatever you're about to tell us because I do believe the Warriors bring a new level of scary when they come to play. The question is getting them to come to play after you've had this much success and you are already who you are and everybody knows who you are. You are the bully on the box. Well, you know, I'm glad you said um, that last piece in regards to what is it that makes Durant do what Durant does in certain situations or certain moments as well as, as well as equal dollar or whatnot. Cause we're going to touch on something here after I read the article is one of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, and as far as what you said about Oklahoma city as posing the, what, uh, you know, uh, one of the yeah. biggest threats to them or whatever, but let me read a snippet from this article. Now this article again is from Lindy's pro basketball and it's the, from this, the, uh, 2016 was, uh, 2016 2017 season and there's this guy michael bradley who writes for lindy's and he wrote uh stopping the unstoppable is the head you know the the header for this article and he says the warriors bring a new level of scary now let me read you i won't read the whole article but i'll read this of uh, an uh, excerpt or two barring any ego problems and fits fights that could occur because of a, shor a shortage of basketballs Golden State is going to be a superiorly potent and definitely favored to win its second title in three years at this time, of course. But as NBA teams struggle with the idea of trying to defend what could be the most efficient offensive juggernaut in league history, new Indiana head coach Nate McMillan looks back to what he considers a seminal moment in recent basketball history. The 2015 Western Conference semifinal series between the Warriors and Memphis could well have changed the entire NBA narrative. Golden State won in six games, but the Grizzlies held a 2-1 advantage at one point and could well have relegated the wide open, spread them out in gun style to the ash heap, had their big and bang strategy, strategy excuse me, produced two more wins. Memphis, unfortunately, couldn't close the series and lost the next three games. 
But McMillan raises an interesting theory about what would have happened had the Grizz prevailed. And he says this, if Memphis had won, we could still be seeing more traditional basketball. It was small ball versus big ball. And because Golden State won, you saw a lot of teams changing the way they play. Now, there are a few more excerpts of this article I'll touch on, but uh, I'm going to read. But let me say this. Let me stop right there and say this. In part, I believe Memphis lost that series because we all know in that series, when he say uh, the small ball versus big ball, if you would, he specifically is talking about the impact and the presence of Mark Gasol and at the time, Zebo. Two of the game's best frontline players in what? Maybe the last 10 or 15 years? No disrespect to Tim Duncan or nobody. You know what I mean? But as far as a, a one-two tandem, I believe in large part Memphis lost that series. And this is not a knock against the Warriors. By no means. Because they were more than formidable, obviously. But Memphis lost that series because they did not have on the perimeter at least half of what the Warriors were able to bring to the perimeter or what the Warriors had on the perimeter. Get what I'm saying? So you can see, in essence, what it was that catapulted the Warriors to win in the finals that year. Because the Cavs themselves also, in the finals, had what the Memphis Grizzlies had, a 2-1 to advantage in the finals. So even then, it just speaks to the Warriors can be beaten. Now, you, I, you know, to... It, I totally agree with you. Your, your, the analysis you gave, I totally agree with you. I think that this opens the door. I don't know if it, that um, that you you all uh, finished reading that part of the article because I definitely want to hear whatever you have to say about that. So, are you finished with that part of it? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, you opened the door, interestingly enough, for a very unique response because I absolutely agree with you, and I'll use your response in my response to say this. Now. You made the point in both instances to to describe for us everything that Memphis did, except you pointed out that they were missing some vital parts. And I'll challenge you by saying this to you, and and I've said this to you off air before, as you know, we had this kind of conversation in the barbershop, that one of the reasons a city like Memphis and Cleveland misses that vital part and Golden State gets it is because it's Memphis and Cleveland. And people never want to say that. But a team like Memphis and Cleveland, Memphis, Cleveland only won the the, uh, national NBA title because of LeBron James. No, full stop. And when Mm. he leaves, that'll be it for Cleveland. And until another LeBron James mother has another LeBron James type child from that area of the country that wants to go there and stay there and lift that organization to where that young man did. And has lifted that organization to and has given and added that kind of value to that city and has given the world an opportunity to look at Cleveland again and appreciate it again. Before that, before LeBron James, nobody wanted to be in Cleveland. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. It was a. It was well, considered, apparently, even with him, at least the second and, time and around, don't exactly nobody wants to steal. They nobody don't want to be here. That's absolutely correct. And so Memphis had that problem that you could get those players either through, remember now, look at Memphis. They got players through a draft. They got players that were traded there reluctantly. Was Zach Randolph, if I remember, he was traded there during this run. Because I remember right. Memphis, because you taught me about the Memphis. You were one of the ones telling us we should pay attention to Memphis. And the reason you have a challenge paying attention to Memphis, a New Orleans team, a Milwaukee team, is because they are not on the national radar. And I don't know why this argument is so hard for basketball players to accept and basketball fans to accept when, in fact, and indeed, this is talked about all the time in the baseball market. The fact that the Yankees are able to attract any free agent they want, the Dodgers, the San Francisco team, the California right. team, the, the fact that these, the, the Chicago Cubs, the Boston Red Sox, there's a reason for that. There's absolutely a reason for that. And so we have to talk about those kind of things as it relates to why, unfortunately, a team like um, Memphis, and you mentioned this earlier again off air, which I thought was a brilliant argument, that a team like Cleveland, if and when they build through the draft properly, then that's why they're successful. And if you look at any small market team, like in baseball, the baseball teams that are small market have to build through the draft. And when and if they do that, they're, uh, they're successful. LeBron was able to come to Cleveland through the draft. 
Kyrie was given to Cleveland through a draft. You get players like that, and if you're able to keep that nucleus together and build from that, you have what you have now. And, you know, that segues perfectly into my next point. The way this Cavs team was put together. Now, you bring up something interesting, and I, I want to mention the, the Pelicans, too. You mentioned, you said something about the Pelicans, and I want to say that uh, something about them in regards to the Warriors and how they, get, how they would possibly have gotten together. But you, the, initially, LeBron Wright was drafted. Kyrie was drafted. But then after all of that shook out and they both were here for a while or whatever the case may be, and in particular, him coming back here, LeBron, that is, him coming back home, I say that cynically, the way the Cavs are built, because I, for one, said he should never have come back here. Dan Gilbert and Agreed. David Griffin or whoever the case may be should have just hunkered down, rolled their sleeves up and said, you know what, we're going to put together a core. No matter what the cake, what kind of icing is on the cake, we're going to make sure it's got eggs, flour, water, and milk. You get what I'm trying to tell you? And we're going to build our core similar to or in the same fashion because you don't have to do what you don't have to be with who they are but you got to see how they did what they did to get to where they are you get what i'm saying Absolutely. so like the warriors before durant they had built that core like the spurs you know what i mean and i say that this Cavs team was constructed basically based on the yellow envelope or what's inside of the yellow envelope you know what I'm saying? It was bought, so to speak. Correct. The Cavs are not built. They were built, let me say it this way. They were built to beat the Warriors or bought to beat the Warriors instead of being bought, or excuse me, built to beat anybody, which is, uh, I think, why they are struggling so much so far or at this point in the season. Because remember now. Uh, may I say, Jay, that I think they're struggling because the players are not good. Let's be honest. The reality is, if it were not the Cleveland Cavaliers, in truth, Tristan Thompson has done nothing to justify his contract in the NBA. Let's be quite honest. Let's be honest. Well, Let's be honest that at yeah, the end of the, he, he's done enough to get a contract, but to, the way he's playing this year, he has not justified that contract at this point. The, so he's not playing well. Um, um, some investigation tells us that Dwayne Wade apparently has yeah, given all his catch. Yeah, he's looking old. Let's be honest. So we have yeah. to talk. Those are the, so we have to talk about those kind of things. The fact is that those players, that team, something has happened to that team sports wise that has caused them to appear to fall off the cliff. Now, but we have to ask now. But but go ahead. I, I prefer it, you to finish, Jay. Please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, because let me let me say this. In terms of this conversation or discussion in basketball, professional or otherwise. You're right. Tristan has not done enough to justify his contract. However, off the record, when it comes to players and players' salaries, regardless of the sport, absolutely, totally agree. They don't get enough. Absolutely, he, totally to me, agree. As far as I'm concerned, more than he, that. Yeah, he's worth every frizzle dime. Agree. Absolutely agree. Absolutely. Because agree. what the owners make, and they don't get enough. Tomatoes. Well, you haven't told me to talk about that, Jay. You told me that we keep it into sports. So, you know, I, I want to respect my host, sir. Okay. I'm, no, trying, I'm, to be, I'm trying to be good. Brother. I mean, I'm come on you. now. Don't I'm get your you. brother started on that. Sir. No, you I'm know, with don't, you. Don't, don't. All right. I know, I know, because I know, I know you can. <laughs> it's, it's a dissertation that folks really ain't ready for. You know what I'm saying? When we go down that road with you, they don't know who Thank they're you. dealing so with. Let's, you know let's keep it sports, my Because you, you're a straight community activist. That's for sure. One of the realest and most genuine ones I know. But, I, you know, let me go back to this what I, uh, about the Pelicans, because I'm going to ask you something a little bit later on uh, in regards to formulas for success in playoff or round robin formats, if you would. Prior to Boogie Cousins going down, I would have had everything stayed the same by the time the playoffs got here. Let's say the Warriors finished the number one seed and the Pelicans were somehow able to stay around that seven or eight. Well, it, had to, it would have had to have been eight. Let's say the Pelicans and Warriors uh, had met in the first round of the playoffs. What I would like to have seen was the Grizzlies 2.0. And that is Anthony Davis and Boogie Cousins versus the Warriors front line. And then on the flip side, the Warriors perimeter versus the Pelicans perimeter. 
Now, I still say the Warriors would have maybe outlasted the Pelicans because almost similar, eerily similar, if you want to say, to the Grizzlies when they had that two-to-one advantage, the Pelicans don't have the firepower on the perimeter to have to match up, you know, with the Golden State or whatnot. And Absolutely. that's the, the key word I'm, or term I'm looking for here is matchups. How critical are matchups in regards to playing a team like the Warriors? I think, Jay, that's the problem. I think that's why I said you have a problem with the Warriors every night because if they all come to play, if all 12 men determine I come to play, what you have is a factor that is – how do you quantify that? Is that quantifiable in that all 12 Golden State Warriors from their first man, meaning that by the time Steph has got himself prepared, he's coming out and tonight he's possibly capable of delivering 50. And Draymond Green has determined he's going to stay in this game tonight. Is that important to the team? This series will focus now. We're ready. Remember now, this is a team that on a whim, won 73 games and realized that they overdid it in, in their perfection and realized the next year that the perfection was not that important. What, in fact, was important was staying healthy. This is all they're playing for this year is to stay so, healthy. So I'm not words, impressed by anything Oklahoma City is doing to them. I'm just telling you the truth because I, I, I believe what? Oklahoma City from 1 to 12 cannot stay with them. Yes, Russell Westbrook can have... 100 points. The reality is that that's wonderful. But between Clay Thompson and Kevin Durant, they can have 120. That's the that's the fact. Yeah. And then you're not factoring in the fact that if if Steph had decided that night he just wants to have 39 and then Draymond wants to have a triple double and then the, the, uh, Andre Iguodala wants to come in and get 12 rebounds and then I, I just name them. Name. So, so ultimately, you're saying that the Warriors can beat you in a myriad of ways. In a myriad of ways. And ultimately, Jay, this is basketball. And let's look at the teams that you've highlighted to us on this broadcast. What's the significance of you highlighting Golden State to start the broadcast? You've mentioned Memphis. You've just mentioned these teams, whether you've done it in, in terms of your professional uh, understanding or just randomly. That's a Jerry West team. That's a Jerry West team. What, what, what's going on with Golden uh, State? Jerry West got committed basketball players. Jerry West was able to identify my favorite basketball player of all time. And you know who he is, Kobe Bryant. And he was able to look at him and realize this young man was special. He was beyond what we thought coming out of the draft so he could come out eighth. But I saw something there. This is Jerry West speaking. And the kind of basketball players he got, and he got a particular kind of coach that would that groom these young men to the NBA way, and he, he had them focus on the fundamentals. And so what you have, listen to what Kevin Durant said. He played with Russell Westbrook. He said playing with Golden State, he said this is how basketball is supposed to be played. So when you talk about Rucker and when you talk about these different things, we're talking about at the end of the day, it's still basketball. So That's from, why the said, park, from the park to the yes, parquet. it's still basketball. Right. So the, the, the guys in Silicon Valley, it's Silicon Valley. They end this con for a reason. You know, you can either be con or con. You, I'll leave that to you to decipher. So the, the reality is you just can't take analytics for everything it is. You, you have to factor in the fact that these young men, these players, when they decide, OK, we're we going to turn this up to another level. When Kevin Durant decided to turn it up to another level, we all watched that. We were all witnesses. He shot that jumper in LeBron's face. We were all witnesses when he came down and stepped in and, and LeBron had to, what could he do, my dear brother? He had to take yeah. it. Is it? Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, and, and I'll read the other portion of this article where an NBA executive said, and this speaks again to how the Cavs are put together. This NBA executive says, I think it's ridiculous that when you have 30 teams in the league that you have to play against, that you have to play against to try to set up to play just one. Again, you cannot build your team to beat that team when you should be building your team to beat anybody. And I know this may, and I love analogies, you know this, and I know this may not be a good one, but I'm going to throw it out here anyway. If you hire a contractor to come build something for your house or build you a house or whatever it is, and you see this guy walk up with just a hammer and nails, you're going to be like, what dude, what you doing? You know what I'm saying? You build your team, oh, okay, so I need my knife. 
on this night. No, I need my sword. You understand? You have to you have to have a full complement of in order to deal with them. Um, you know what I'm saying? Or, or to, no, let me let me take that back. Not only to deal with them, but to deal who, with whoever it is you face. And you know what? Then this, for whatever reason, I don't know why, it just came to mind. You know what this, when you're building uh, an NBA team to beat anybody, you know what I'm, it puts me in the mind frame of? The game What's of that? death. Okay. Every level. Do you understand? If Bruce Lee had only learned the Tiger style, he wouldn't have got, okay. past, he wouldn't have got to the third level. You might have to break that down for your audience off air and put that on and have refer them to that because that's some heavy science you're raising the game of death of the great Bruce Lee. Yeah, you, you, I say, you, yeah, very, very true. Very you true, get what you understand true. what I'm saying? Yes, that's right. how you you have to construct your team the way he had to have this, the, 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 the all of the styles. Yes. And here's the killer part. The reason why you build your team to beat anybody because you don't know who you're going to play. He didn't yeah. know until he got to that next level who it was he was going to meet at that next level. Well, the idea, let's, let's, let's be honest about that, Jay. The idea is that everybody thought we all made the assumption, and we understand that there's a problem with that. We all had the assumption that the Cavs were going to naturally advance to the finals. That the East was not going to be a challenge. Remember now, the general consensus, I would guarantee you that if you polled 90%, if you, now we're able to do that in real time, go back and look at what the major media would have been saying. I don't know what they were saying. I wasn't listening. But I know what they were saying on Twitter, which is the, the apparatus I'm on. If, if you were listening to them on Twitter, the majority of people were saying Kyrie Irving was a fool. This was not going to work out. He's leaving LeBron. LeBron's going to be all right without him. Didn't turn out to be that way, my dear brother. Why? Uh, yeah, well, we all know. Why? But what does that say? What does that say about their ability to interpret what they're looking at and say, tell us what's happening? No, not so good. You see, and we have to look at the calf. What's going on with the calf? Do we really understand what's going on with the calf? You probably can tell us more. You probably have more insight into the calf than Stephen A. Smith. I'm just be keeping it real. And I appreciate that. You feel me? I'm keeping it real. Yeah. At the end of the day, um, I say, well, we're going we're, we're gonna to definitely talk. That's going to be the last thing that we discuss. We're going to discuss what's going on with the Cavs. Okay. Save, okay. save the best for last. But I want to say yes. this, this, this last point in this article. And this is, in, this is Nate McMillan talking again in regards to the Golden State Warriors. That style of play. Have you heard me use those words before? Absolutely. In terms of the Cavs, their style of play is not conducive to winning the title. Absolutely. Stop talking about rebounds and what um, a point. I'm not saying those things don't matter, but what a guy's averaging, he averaged 30 and 30. Like that's the end all be all to, to what the outcome of a game is going to be or what kind of success a guy's going to have. It's your style of play. Adding names to a roster only makes you no more than paper champions. You still got to play it out. So he says that style of play, again, talking about the Warriors, it's really difficult to scout because it's more of a flow and not predictable. But here's the key. You make them predictable by slowing them down. And you slow them down by going inside first. Force them to play your style. Like we just saw in the Super Bowl. I don't know if you Indeed. watched it with the Eagles and the Patriots. We're going to touch on okay. that, too. I said the, okay. the Cavs was the last thing, but I just thought about that in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Get your thoughts on that, too, before we get out of here. But make them play your style. So, yes, the Warriors are unpredictable, but guess what? If I watch enough film on you and I really know what it is I'm looking for, and, this, and I'm not watching this, the film, or should I say the film is not watching me, and I'm really studying then I'm going to find your tendencies because you all every they all have tendencies. Yeah, but Jay, you know, you're you're opening up doors every time you say these things because again, I always challenge you with respect to this, my dear brother, is that you are far more advanced in your interpretation of this game and what you're looking at than the average person. And I would dare challenge you that what you're challenged by is the coaches, the average coach's ability in the NBA to confer the information you have just conferred to us so succinctly. To their players. They can't communicate it to them brothers. The reality is these are AAU players that have good talent. The coaches, however, can I ask you a question, sir? Of course. Does Ty Lue 
is he considered the coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers? Can you coach a king? Can, can you name a no, coach? No, I see him, king I see him a as a figurehead. Oh, okay. We, that's how the entire nation sees him. This is the fact. We all know that he's a figurehead. So these young men are not given to coaching. And when you're not, they're given to coaching, but it has to be a particular coach. It has to be a particular attitude and disposition. So you're talking about a team and applying a system that say, yes, they can be beaten, but you have to attack them on this front. You have to attack them on the Now, how do you get a coach in today's, today BA, as you call it? Right. They call it the NBA. But how do you get a coach in today's NBA to coach players to that to that level of discipline where every play for for entire seven game series? So you'll see there a team. You mentioned this that the Cavs could hold it together for a minute a few years ago where they had the advantage. But the reality is they can't hold it together anymore. They couldn't hold it together over the long stretches. You watch these teams, they can't hold it together over the long stretch. They can't take the grind. Why? Because these players are living the luxury life, my dear brother. They're flying on private jets. They're not on buses and flying commercial planes. They're not like yeah. Dr. J. And they're not, that's why you see a separation between that era, between Jordan and how those players look at these younger players because these players get a boo-boo and they got to take two weeks off and they need to go to the chiropractor and get treatment. And and yeah. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I think they should. You must take care of your body. Absolutely. You can't yeah. certainly let the, let the owners, quote-unquote, use you like a horse. So you should take care of your body and you should take all the rest you need and take all advantage of all the luxuries. But there's a difference in the climate. And so see, what you're asking for is a committed basketball player. And I would dare say to you that those are far you between in the NBA today. And you know, as you and call it the today BA. Yeah, or the new BA. And that's that's another I'm glad you brought that up too because I want to make it clear again if I haven't already. Um my I'm glad for whatever the players including LeBron and I have a Indeed. disdain for him. You already know that. Yeah. When it comes to ownership versus the players, get get yours. Do you understand? But my thing is this. As a respect or in regards to your craft and principle and the fan base, do you understand? There is an the onus is on you to, regardless of what your what your check is looking like. You understand? What I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, you're not getting past me from a competitive standpoint. True, indeed. Do you understand what I'm what I'm watching the Cavs go through right now? If it's a message or they're trying to send a message to management, you know what I mean, and trying to force Dan Gilbert's hand and trading this pick or whatever the case may be, I mean, you know, do what you got to do. Is That's why it's, yeah, hey, negotiations. You're on that side, I'm on this side. But at the same time, man, it's folks who can't can barely afford to come down there to see y'all do this. You get what I'm saying? So if nothing else, and I don't know where you draw that balance or that divide or how you go about doing it or whatever. I don't play in the NBA. No, 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 no. I, I totally agree with you. Absolutely you know agree. You, you Absolutely. got to, you have to give, you say it's about the fans or you say you respect the fans, then you can't come out and, and be, um, because again, in this day and age of whose team it is, again, we know this is LeBron's team. So on this team, it's LeBron's you can't, league. It's LeBron's LeBron. league. There you go. So you can't LeBron's come league. out and give listless effort on the defensive end. Do you understand? If if it's your team, then when all of the headlines and when things are going well, point to point the people the first thing people point to is you, then when the things ain't going right, you know what I'm saying, you're getting bottom shelf critique. It don't you can be mad. No, you it don't work like that because with on this same team now, this season, these dudes won eighteen out of nineteen. So what's the problem? You understand what I'm saying? I absolutely do. All of a I, sudden, I, we need this guy, and we need that guy, and we need more help, and we need more of this, and we need more of that. No. Play man up and play it out. Man up and play it out. Now, let me ask you this right quick, too, before we get back to finishing out with the Cavs and the Super Bowl. We'll finish it out with the what the happened in the Super Bowl. You and I have talked before, as you mentioned, about basketball. And those things that are tried and true. 
again, whether it's from the all, from the park all the way to the parquet, and that you what I call must have translatables. And I'll, I'll I'll remind you of an example I used some time ago. You and I were talking um, prior to Kevin Durant coming into the league, and you asked me. You said, "Ah, man, what you what you think?" I said, "Listen, I can't really tell you overall what type of dude he's gonna be at the next level." But what I look for in a collegiate player, and I don't watch college basketball as much as I used to, but that's a story for another that's a conversation for another day. But okay. what I look for in a player is, is at least he has to have at least one next level translatable. OK, must have traits. And I said, I don't know what he's going to be overall. I said, but that jump shot. Is I remember next level. you saying you get, I distinctly remember you saying that. You get what I'm saying? I distinctly remember you mentioning a jump shot. Distinctly. So. When I say going into this season's postseason or this year's playoffs, would you agree? Not only do you have, in other words, the must. What are the must haves in order to not only win, you know, whether it's your first round or second round, but to get to the finals and win the finals? And I say must have title traits. And let me ask you, and you can add to this. If you if you got something, but I, I came up with this. He's a he a few of the must have title traits in order to win. Okay. Matchups, mm-hmm. your style of play, and defense. Now, do you want to add to that or do you want to expound on the ones I just given? Well, and I, I'll say this again, people in your listening audience may certainly and certainly are welcome to not agree with me on this, but I'll use what has commonly been referred to as Mamba mentality. You got to want it. You got to ah, want it. Okay. All the things that you've described to us can be in your favor, but if you don't want it, if you don't want it. Wow. Okay. The New England Patriots were favored this year, but the Eagles wanted it. Got I you. saw the Super Bowl, and I saw. I don't watch football, as you know. I'm not a football guy. And I had never seen a Nick Foles game before. And I said to the people who was a New England fan watching the game with me, I said, that guy's life is never going to be the same again because he looks as good as the other guy you're telling me is the best player in the NFL. You have Mm. to want it. And I saw a clip on, on Twitter this morning of that young man telling his coach, run this play for me. Why? Because I want it. And I'm not mm. going to miss the catch. Like the guy you say is the greatest, we're going to run the same thing, but I'm going to catch the ball because I'm going to run fast enough and hard enough. I'm going to go put my hands far enough. I'm going to shoot this jumper like Kobe. I don't care if I shoot 20 of these and I miss. And you know, that's why I love Kobe. You know, that's why I respect Jordan because those are the difference. And people talk about the difference. I love, you know, I have tremendous admiration for the young king, LeBron James. As an individual, as a man, as a father, as an NBA player, as a professional, as a businessman, as a leader, as a man that young men and women can look up to and admire, as a man that's a leader in this community, I love and respect him and admire him. I don't in any way compare him as a basketball player to, to Kobe Bryant. I'm sorry, I love him. I love Kobe, that Kobe will take 25 shots and miss them, but he's going to take the game winner and he's going to hit it and he doesn't care. If the media writes that he's taken, he doesn't care. He, he And he will curse you out if necessary and make you understand that he doesn't care. And you can call him arrogant and you can say this and you can share for him when he gets a rape case. and you can. But he's still going to go out every night. Look, the record is there, man. You can go look it up. He was going to a rape case in Colorado every night and flying to games and scoring 40 points. He was being charged yeah. by a woman who gave herself to, but he went to, he would fly on a private jet to court and then go to a game that night and still score 40 and 50 points a night. Ask the NBA players about Mamba mentality. So you can have all the other stuff, matchups, and, but any team that comes to the final that don't have Mamba mentality, what, what do we love about the Greek freak? He got that, he got that mentality. Yeah, okay. You know? Oh, okay. what, what do we love about our young brothers in Philadelphia? What do we see coming out of Philadelphia? We see some boys that got that dog in them. We see that. We know that dog. We hear that barking now. And you know, when you when you understand, you know, oh, what, what is that noise? Oh, somebody that house, they got a dog in that house. Yeah. And you yeah. see you see the sign, beware of the dog. Philly, they got dogs in Philly, brother. They got dogs. 
They got dogs in Golden State, and when they come to run with you, you better be prepared. They got dogs, man. Everybody so, can't go to the rucker. They you got to there's dogs up there. They, yeah. they come to run every night. They don't they don't play. You played at the, the Wood Hill Park. They got dogs up there, man. They, they got to be in the NBA. They ain't got to be the NBA to be a dog. Yeah. They got dogs at the post office, man. Come on, there's people at your job right now at your desk. You look over and you see him. You know he got dog in him. You don't play with that guy right there. But that other guy, he's a nice guy now. He's the owner. He's the manager. He's the king. But he ain't that guy over there. Well, you know, you know what? I said we was going to talk about the Super Bowl and so on and so forth. But after you just put down that piece right there, it's no need for us to say anything else other than this. What you talk about is that what's in that chest cavity. Chest and you can have the best ingredients imported from all around the world. But if you don't know how to cook... What difference do it make? You can have your matchups, and you can have your X's yes. and O's, and you can set a pick, or you can call a timeout and then run a play and use strategy out of a timeout. But if you don't want it, in other words, don't none of that stuff or won't none of that other stuff work. No. So, again, I apologize to all my listeners and viewers and followers and fans and homies and family or whatever it is out there. When I say we was going to talk Super Bowl, and even though we touched on it here and there, but after Brother Richard just said what he said, it's a done deal. We're going to have to get back with y'all on the rest of that stuff a little later on at another time. So on that note, it's been fun, but we got to run. Appreciate y'all for listening to the Shop Report. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter. Or email us to shopreport365 at gmail.com. Check us out on iTunes. And if you would, go to our Spreaker page, Spreaker.com, the Shop Report, and give us a follow. 100 follows gets us to iHeartRadio. And if that don't work, Google it. For my man, my main man, Brother Richard, I'm Barbershop J. And remember, the next time y'all want to know what's really going on, man, come to the shop. Walk-ins are always welcome. Holla.